in today's episode, we've got Sean Crowley, um, an expert in the pre-sales and architecture space. Sean, do you want to tell them a bit about yourself? And we'll dive into some uh, questions that I'm sure the listeners would love to hear. Uh, you know, wide ranging for, you know, the better part of 20 plus years of being in the tech industry. Um, you know, I've done everything from corporate IT to, you know, live, working in Silicon Valley and being involved in big tech with Oracle um, back to, you know, running two different software as a service startups. Um, you know, it, it's funny when we, we talked about having this conversation, I find myself reflecting a little bit in my career. I was actually discussing it yesterday. And I, I've been fortunate in that I've been involved in two really kind of unique I would say technology revolutionary sort of situations in that the first one, um, this goes back years. Um, this is, you know, back when, you know, cell phone used to come in the big case and, you know, it, it, you know, you didn't have one in your car, all those kind of things. And you think about, you know, sort of the advent of the first uh, laptops and they called them the luggables, right? You got a compact laptop and it also came in a case. And so at that time I was at Oracle and Oracle was experimenting with the ability to do database transactions via satellite modem, right? And I mean, this is way before, you know, any real mobile or web technologies. This was, you know, literally a satellite modem that plugged into the PCIMCA slot of your laptop and then was able to communicate user with the user interface and send database transactions over a satellite modem. And I think back about that, and you know, like I didn't have the appreciation for how cutting and bleeding edge that was when we were doing it. But then, you know, I fast forward it today and I think about it and I go, wow, we were so far ahead in anything anyone else was doing with that technology. I move a little further and I had found myself at corporate IT at the Gartner Group, right? And this is the advent of Java, right? This is just, at, just as Sun Microsystems had released Java. And we had decided that we're going to build this whole, ironically, like almost like the first cloud-based subscription model to sell Gartner research via PDF versus, you know, paper. And this little company at the time comes to us called Google, right? Because at that day, Alta Vista and Yahoo were really sort of the de facto standard search engines. And Google was just coming onto the market. And Google had come to us and wanted to sell us what was called a Google search appliance. So literally, the Google index on a Blade server that you plugged into your data center, fed it your content, it indexed it, and then it became searchable. So, you know, I look at those two things in my career and think how revolutionary they were at the time between mobile, first, you know, one of the first adopters of Java as a serious enterprise platform, the, you know, the building of a true subscription model that would, you know, morphed into, you know, what is today's, you know, cloud subscription model. And then, you know, the, the, the working with Google all really set the tone for a very interesting career. I mean, all, all of that is the backdrop. Then ultimately what that drove me is to really want to be more in front of customers to evangelize and talk technology, which led to, you know, my roles within pre-sales, leading pre-sales, and then customer success on top of it. So a little long-winded, but, you know, yeah, you, you, from my perspective in pre-sales, you have to be able to talk the talk and you have to have a solid background having actually done the work in technology to be really a trusted advisor when you go and sit down with a CIO who's really looking for your advice. And and when you first got into Gartner, what was, you know, your kind of experiences there initially and what kind of led you to move down the technical route of engineering before, you know, we fast forward down the line to moving into more of a commercial role? Sure. Um, so interesting question. So, you know, I found myself, you know, leading organizations when I went to Gartner. And again, we were developing, you know, multiple portions of the portfolio that ultimately, you know, became Gartner.com and, you know, all of the things, the searchability, the download of the, you know, research, the creation of the research, the categorization of research. And what happens in corporate IT, if you want it to, is you begin to get higher into the corporation and less about the technology. And what you find is, is that you are much more about coming up with ideas, selling concepts back to the business, and then getting people to agree that A, from a market perspective, this is the things we ought to be working on. But, but, but secondly, from a funding perspective, this is a project that a business unit wants to fund and wants to be the champion of. And once you start doing that enough, the natural progression for me was when, you know, I was approached by Oracle 
to do that sort of a work, but more on a pre-sales perspective, right? And, and sort of get out of corporate IT and worrying about technologies and systems that I owned and supported, and instead help organizations externally um, understand the art of the possible and what sort of a bill of materials might look like that would solve their particular problems, whether it was, you know, business process improvement, whether it was collaboration, whether it was just, you know, the extension of mobile apps and those sort of things. But having gone through that corporate IT growth sort of put me on the path to say, hey, I'm good at speaking to people. I've gotten, I've honed the skills of being able to take what is a really complex technical thing and explain it in a simplified way that it makes sense and then get on board from an architectural perspective that people will say, hey, that makes a lot of sense. I see what you're doing and I appreciate the fact that you're telling me what to do, not just giving me five options of which then I have to choose. So, so that was kind of, the, kind of the advent in my career is how I went from um, you know, just expanding the breadth of technology that I spoke about, really getting much more in front of C level executives who made who are making decisions. And and I guess back, you know, in the the early days there when you joined Oracle, I guess their portfolio was nowhere near as big as it is today. And you know, maybe they was heavily involved in middleware. And for a lot of listeners that are maybe you know new to SaaS software, they maybe don't understand what the middleware part does. Um, so just wanted to find out from your perspective. When you was hired, was it straight to kind of cover the the middleware offering, or was you kind of working on a few different product portfolio um, areas? It's, it, so it's interesting you say that. So when I joined Oracle to help run the middleware business, there were just a few of us, right? So they, they, this was a new area of the market that Oracle was getting into. At the time, let's just say they had three fundamental product, pro products in the middleware space, right? Uh, you know, a J2EE application server, um, some light messaging, and, you know, they had just purchased a company to focus on, um, you know, what was called Beeple, you know, business process execution language, which was a standard years ago, not much in the marketplace today. But those were sort of the three main products. And so, you know, that's what we focused on. It, initially to build enablement, educate the marketplace that Oracle was in the middleware space. Uh, you know, we were competing with IBM. At the time, it was BEA that we were competing with. We, we obviously ultimately bought them. But, you know, in those first couple of years, I went from really running discussions and evangelizing three products to the fact that we probably, by the end of the end of the first couple of years, we had probably purchased upwards of like 80 different companies. Right. Wow. So we did Sun Microsystems. We did BEA. So the umbrella of technology that Oracle had acquired in the middleware space in the first three years that I was there, you know, leading the, that effort, you know, you know, quintupled, whatever, you know, whatever your, you know, number is. I mean, it went from, you know, those three to a whole umbrella in queuing security, business intelligence, true messaging and middleware you know, out to, you know, different, you know, event systems and all those kind of things. So it became a very good breadth of technology offerings. But as you can imagine, then, as a pre-sales leader, um, you know, bringing staff on who understood those different nuances and then creating an organization that was much more specialized in each one of those kind of pockets became really the thing that we had to focus on, right? Because, you know, with 80 some different technologies, you can't have somebody who's a jack of all trades, a master of none. Yeah. You really had to say, hey, I'm going to have folks that are specific, specifically focused on security or focus specifically on, you know, development and, you know, things like DevOps and those kind of things. And then folks are specifically focused on business intelligence, right? So that was sort of the advent of how that umbrella of technologies expanded. But then from a pre-sales engineering leader, how you have to then begin to segment things, not only from who's going to speak to whom at a customer, but also what kind of training, what kind of programs, how do they collaborate? All of those things happens out of the growth of the product stack that you're you know, looking to shepherd to customers. And I guess whilst you was in Oracle in those early years, they were you know, still a, a multinational company. They had probably offices all over. At any point in your, you know, long stint at Oracle, did you ever have an opportunity to, you know, work abroad? It's a question I always like to ask. Sure, sure, sure. So certainly there was global support from an evangelism perspective, um, but it was more collaborative. It wasn't necessarily 
at least from North American sales, boots on the ground in Europe, right? They had their own resources. Um, did we collaborate with them? Yes. Did we work on joint enablement and, um, you know, certifications with the folks in, you know, the European regions? Absolutely. Um, but they were boots on the ground, right? That we, we would maybe assist on a demonstration or conversation remotely, but we would not typically take North American technology resources and fly them to an opportunity in London, as an example, right? So it was a collaborative thing, but it wasn't a, uh, you know, a, a, a territorial thing. They they owned those relationships. They spoke the languages. They knew the business customs in each one of those countries. Um, so it was much more of a support system than it was actually being physically there hand in hand helping. And at which point would you say during that time at Oracle, did they start to really, the, the cloud technology really start to take off and it was all, you know, shifting from on-prem more towards, you know, on the cloud as such. And how did that affect Oracle and so your team it. directly? Sure. So that's an interesting question, right? So I, I, you know, I think many would argue that fundamentally Oracle was probably a little later to the game from a cloud perspective than an AWS or a Google or a Microsoft. And so, I mean, that had obviously pros and cons, right? The, the, the con was obviously that you, you know, you're fighting for existing market share and you had to, you know, evangelize the value of why this cloud versus that cloud. So that was the con. The pro was, is that, you know, I think from a technology perspective, Oracle had an opportunity to learn from what the others had done and where they had made missteps to, you know, build a extremely robust and solid cloud platform that not only we could sell and leverage for customers, but we could also build then our application footprint on, right? And I think that's one of the things that was unique about Oracle in that, you know, you look at an AWS or Google and they're selling platform as a service and they're selling, you know, infrastructure. Well, Oracle took it one step higher and that they could actually sell software as a service because they had fusion, they had human capital management, they had financials, all being built on the cl cl same cloud infrastructure that we would sell you as a customer if you were just going to run your own workload and work own applications there, right? So that would, in my mind, would have been, a, you know, one of the advantages. From a pre-sales perspective, it, it, it too had pros and cons in that, you know, pre-sales, at least initially, was responsible for continuing to support and drive the on-premise license business, while at the same time trying to get customers to migrate to the cloud. Um, so you had lots of things to have conversations about. The challenge was that, um, you know, it was a very fine line, right? Because how do you justify to a customer who's been running Oracle database in their own data center for the last 15 years, and you've been helping them expand that footprint to the next day, then having the conversation. So, you know what? You actually should take that workload that you've been running in your data center and move it to Oracle Cloud. And the question becomes, okay, well, why? Well, you know, this, that, and the other thing, right? So there was a good two year period from a transition perspective where it was challenging because you were, you're, you're trying to get a customer to, to, do a like for like movement when they're already successful in their on-premise technology, right? So you, it was trying to find a compelling event got to be uh, challenging, right? Because, you know, you're basically asking them just to take their workload out of their data center and put it in, in Oracle Cloud, right? And it was always, well, why would I do that? Is it cost? Is it convenience? Is it, you know, better performance? All those things. So yes, there was definitely a transition, but from a pre-sales perspective, for a couple of years, we covered both the on-premise and cloud until you know we got to a point where there was a significant amount of cloud customers in cloud that it made sense to sort of divide and conquer and have folks focus only on moving on-premise workloads to the cloud, while other folks focused specifically on you know sort of net new cloud transactions that were platform as service or infrastructure as a service, what have you. But it must have been a game changer for Oracle as you know a selling point went. They had acquired all of these different softwares, as you mentioned, HCM, ERP, data, AI. When they was able to package these along with the infrastructure, it must have been a game changer in terms of revenue, but also expanding the market share for a certain period, of course, before other companies started to mirror those and you know have so many different offerings. They were able to compete 
in the transformational space as such. Right. No, no, it, it's, I, I mean, I, I wouldn't necessarily use the word game changer, but it was definitely, you know, a competitive advantage to introduce cloud to a customer that was an existing PeopleSoft customer who was time for an upgrade, had gotten the corporate mandate from their CIO that they wanted to focus more on cloud, they wanted to spend less in their data center, and then that opened up the conversation that said, hey, rather than moving people soft to in just infrastructure, get out of your data center, let us, let us introduce to you the HCM version, the cloud version of the equivalent, and just move to that. Let's migrate you to that. We'll, we'll, you know, we'll help you with consulting and we'll move that to you. And, you know, so A, it helped most IT organizations get in line with what the corporate strategy was, which was to go more in cloud, cut data center costs. But it also helped the IT organizations in, in another way, which was most on-prem applications, companies customized the living daylights out of it, right? They, they spent 15 years running this, you know, PeopleSoft application. And through the course of those 20 years, every department in the company had asked for some level of different reporting or I need this data field that's not in there today. And they did all these tweaks and things. And what most organizations found when they went to do an upgrade, at least if they were going to do it on-premise, it was extremely hard to do the upgrade because they had to account for all of the things that they had band-aid on to the core application over the course of 20 years, right? So that was always a very challenging proposition. But what they also found was, is if they look to do a net new platform, and I'll call it vanilla, with all those, all those customizations, what they found was 90% of the time, nobody complained about losing all those customizations over the course of 20 years, right? I remember dealing with an organization that had, I want to say, 2,800 custom financial reports. And they cut over to a new financial system, and I think they probably only had to migrate less than 5% of those custom reports over to the new platform because most customers within that company couldn't remember what they had asked for in the first place and wasn't even using it, right? So there's a lot of advantages when you do that sort of approach and move to you know the cloud version of an existing on-premise application that really allows an IT organization to cut a lot of fat that they had been asked to produce over the course and history of that application. As you said, it's, it, it becomes as over time, so many customizations and requests, you do lose track of what you're trying to achieve, especially in a larger organization. So I understand that. And just, I want to step back just a little bit um, and just find out, you know, as I said, for the audience, a lot of the audience here are going to be trying to move into pre-sales and really understand, you know, the, the fundamentals of pre-sales. So in your own words, I just want to ask you, you know, when the word technical advisor gets thrown around and people say, look, you know, we need somebody as a, you know, technical specialist to help run demos. So I just want you to kind of give an overview of what a day in the life of a pre-sales um, consultant would look like and what, you know, your definition of a technical advisor is and helping them to solve their pain points as such. Sure. So that's an interesting question. And, and you know, I, I think, at least in my mind, the true definition of a sales consultant, technical consultant, enterprise engineer, enterprise architect, in my mind, has really morphed over the course of my career. And I say that in that you brought up the word demo. Originally, that role tended to be extremely specialized and extremely technically focused in that you were a demo jockey, jo jo demo jockey right? Your job was to come in and show the technical folks how it worked and how it was going to play in their environment. And, and that was fine, at least at Oracle, when we were trying to make a dent in the market and establish a brand, right? Because you really had to you know, show folks what you were talking about and what you brought to the table. The reason why I say it morphed is that, you know, at least from having done and built organizations, what I look for when I look for pre-sales engineers is much more of the soft skills. Sure, you want someone to understand technology, but you can teach them product and you can teach them, you know, methodology and how to be fluent and having a conversation around the bites and bits. What you can't typically teach are the soft skills, right? So the reason I say it morphed is, is I, I very much wanted people that were extremely comfortable in a large audience talking about technology in a very simplified way. 
even more so, what I really wanted, and I think this is gonna, this is the answer to your question, which is how I define it. The salespeople can always go in and at least introduce the product. What they're not always strong at is asking technically leading questions that drive to the ultimate business problem the customer wants to solve, right? Because most times the customer doesn't even want to solve it, right? The customer will say to you, well, we're on this path of digital transformation. Okay, well, what does that mean to you, right? So a good pre-sales engineer ought to be able to ask what we would call up and down leading questions, right? Up to where the money's going, down to what the ultimate problem is with your customer, and be able to do a thorough discovery and analysis of, is there a problem here? Can the customer define the problem? Are we talking to the right person within the customer who can ultimately make this decision? Are they willing to be engaged in a much more regular process to be an executive champion on the customer end so that when we have additional questions, they're knowledgeable and can bring the right people in to answer them, right? Because it could go a high question that might be nothing more than about a business process. It could be a low-level question that goes all the way down to, hey, what operating system are you running? Are you virtualizing applications? All of those things. And then the last thing that I would say has really come is it's a combination of industry knowledge and then value selling, right? It can't be about just product and it can't be technology for the sake or, or, or you know, technology looking for a solution, right? It really has to be value-based in what will resonate with a CIO who's ultimately going to write the check for whatever they're looking to buy from you, right? It's got to be down to what's this return on investment? What is it going to save me, right? Is it going to save me, you know, floor space and cooling costs in my data center? Is it going to save me from doing a hardware refresh a year from now because, you know, all of my server technology is five years old? Is it going to save me, you know, 40 hours a week from an operational perspective because the application we're looking to where we're, we're running is 25 years old and needs a lot of care and feeding, right? Is it going to save me programming hours because the back end of the application that we're looking to build a new front end on is in COBOL? And I have two people that still know COBOL, right? So it's all of those things, but that's why I say I think it's more from a much more technical role. Sure, you need to understand all the bites and bits and you need to be able to be conversant on everything from cloud infrastructure to, you know, React and Node.js building applications. But you have to be business savvy and have to be collaborative to ask the right questions and put the technology solution in context of how it's going to influence the business so that that CIO can sell it to his constituents. So a little bit of a long-winded answer, but I really think it's core. The whole role sort of morphed over the last 20-some years. And, and... If we go back, you know, 15, 20 years, I guess the, the products were probably, you know, in my opinion, a lot more technical than they are now. So, you know, the emphasis, you know, was more on having those technical foundation skills in programming, like, you know, back then Java, for example, with, you know, the rise of low code and no code platforms, you know, a lot of applications now are pretty easy to, you know, sell or to understand and configure as such. They're not as complex as they maybe was 15, 20 years ago. So is that why you would say, it's definitely more of an all-rounded approach that you need to have the business knowledge and be comfortable with, you know, being able to solve the problems rather than being a very technical guy, then trying to transition into the business side of things. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, so I think you actually even started to answer a little bit. I mean, if I think back to day one, I mean, you're explaining to customers how to use a Java application server, which in itself needed to be explained because they didn't know what that was all the way through how they're going to architect an application, right? And and I mean, I go back to the earliest days of Java, which at the time was extremely complex, right? You're doing enterprise session beans, you're doing EJBs, you're doing, you know, facades and all these different patterns. And, you know, even that, when you're building an application, is millions and millions of lines of code in an extraordinarily large code base. And then they brought out servlets and then JSPs and other libraries. And the next thing you know, you know, your code base is, you know, the deployment of that code base itself could have been, you know, 15, 20, 30 ear files, war files, jar files, stuff everywhere, right? There were so many parts and pieces to get any one thing to work. You fast forward to today and, you know, you're explaining how to build applications And, you know, you can point and click someone and look at them and go, okay, I'm going to use Microsoft as an example. I'm going to go, you you can in a couple hours, 
connect GitHub to your Microsoft Azure portal, build four Microsoft you know, functions, connect those functions to a Cosmo database all within the Azure portal, have that all wrappered around security using Microsoft IAM, plug it all again back into um, you know, GitHub, and then tie that into a you know, CI CD loop, right? And you can do that in a matter of days and have a very functional application that also has all of the technical operational things from an administrative perspective that 20 years ago you had to put in place. You had to buy a tool for it. You had to have somebody sitting at a desk watching this stuff versus today the automation. I mean, it's one click. I upload from, you know, Visual Studio Code, the, the you know, the function that I just created via Git goes into GitHub, initializes a build process, and in three and a half minutes, I go out to Microsoft Azure, and that function's out there running with database connectivity, and it's versioned. So I, don't, well, I wouldn't say you're less technical. I would say the evolution of the technology and the speed at which you can be productive is so significantly different from what it was then that it's easier to talk about that technology because there's really a lot less explanation that has to come behind it. Definitely, I agree. And, and going back to you know what we was talking about, the qualities in good pre-sales engineers. Now, if we talk about you know things that you would classify as teachable skills, like you know some soft skills, you either have it or you don't. You know, but right. in terms of things that are teachable um, versus things that are just in their DNA, what would you say those things are in your own description? And you know, where would you be able to identify these things easily in in a first or second conversation or is it something that takes time to of interviewing candidates being in those leadership roles where you start to un, unpick which, you know, right away are the right people? So I tend to look for folks who have been in different industries, who have a conversational technical background, right? I, I don't necessarily need somebody who coded COBOL, but I do want someone who understands the difference between COBOL, vSAM, you know, what a tandem, you know, package is, Unisys, and can really talk through more of the life cycle of IT and to understand what is relevant today all the way through low code, right? So maybe not necessarily have, have, have had done it, but understands the concepts and understands the differences and can have a technical conversation. Multi-generational is maybe the wrong way to describe it, but multi-architectural, right? I mean, everything from client server to today's cloud native thought processes, and actually then can compare and contrast them and why you're doing one thing versus the other, right? And then, you know, the other thing is, is, is just sort of presence, right? People who are comfortable being in front of an audience, comfortable asking questions, comfortable saying, no, this can't do that, but I would do this. Those are the kind of folks that, you know, I like to bring into an organization. And, and no, you don't necessarily get it in the first interview, but you do, in my opinion, get a sense of someone's DNA and how, if they're capable of being in front of a very senior leader and at a customer and answering a very difficult question, and more importantly, um, being able to calm a customer when they're disgruntled, right? Because half the time when you go into an existing customer, the first conversation is always what you did the last time that didn't work, what you said was going to work that they haven't gotten to. So, you know, it, it, you have to have that ability to be able to put that on the side and get back to what you're really there to have a conversation about, right? So those are kind of the skills that I look for when interviewing folks to bring into a pre-sales and engineering, uh, engineering organization. A lot more than, hey, here's a sample test. I want to see you write, you know, you know, three Java applications in a half hour or, you know, you know what's, what's a dictionary in Python or what's any of those kind of things. I, I, that's not my style. I'd rather have people that you can talk, teach the tech to, but are comfortable being in front of people day one. And, and I guess that kind of ties in to what, to what you're saying about, you know, objection handling effectively and being able to really understand and develop that relationship with the customer right. because in some ways it's not you know you don't need to be the most technical guy but being able to handle those objections on the spot and being able to present i guess in, in today's you know definition of pre-sales is more and more important i guess because now with remote working and things like that maybe you don't get to get in front of the customer as you would have done 10 years ago where it's you know you're on the road every week 
once or twice at least. No, I agree. I mean, look, there, there's something to be said for having the ability to, and I'll call it architect on the fly, right? You know, to your point, back in the day, you would be in a corporate office or a corporate facility with a room of IT folks and their leaders, and you'd have the ability to walk up to a whiteboard and just start to sketch out an idea from a technical perspective. Now you've got to explain it via voice because, you know, I don't have the ability to do a whiteboard and be in the room right now. So there's definitely a level of creativity that comes with being a good, uh, you know, pre-sales engineer or enterprise architect because you do have to ask some intelligent technical questions, understand the footprint in the environment of which the customer works. And then assemble pieces, and a lot of times on the fly, around what they have to architect a solution that will get them to where they're looking to go. I understand it. Just two two more questions. There's something going to these, you know, pre-sales events. A, a lot of people have asked me some questions, which I want to ask to you, just so you can kind of share your opinion on what it is. So, if somebody was to ask you, "Hey, Sean, what? You know, I'm, I'm new to pre-sales. I don't really understand what it is. Like, I hear this this." you know, this term proof of concept and value proposition, what, what, what does that actually mean? So if you could present, you know, your opinions on what that means and how you go about that to really deliver that for the customer, I think some of the listeners would take a lot of value from that. Sure, sure, sure. So yeah, the, the idea of a proof of concept, much like the role itself, uh, has changed over the course of years, right? So, you know, if I go back 15 years, you know, A, I would always try to get out of doing a proof of concept as often as possible, right? Because, you know, as sales say, you know, time kills all deals. And if you've got to do, you know, a proof of concept for 30 days, that's a long time and a lot of places for something to go wrong or for the customer to get disengaged, all those kind of things. So if I could, I would always try to err on the side of a more custom demo than I would actual proof of concept. That was... 15 years ago, when you're dealing with on-premise software and, you know, you've got to do installations and all these kind of things, and do they have a test environment? It just, it made it a lot longer of a sales process. So I tried to avoid that, but that's ultimately what you do. Fast forward to today, and, and really what I've gotten focused on when you look at the idea of showing and telling a customer about software is really getting a customer to sign up for, in cloud platforms, uh, like let's call it a 30-day trial. And what the agreement we try to come to is that they're going to sign up for a 30-day trial and build a minimal viable product in whatever service they needed to within the platform, right? Maybe it's just modeling databases. Maybe it's a database and user interface, what have you. But we would come to an agreement that they're going to get a free 30-day trial. We're going to build this minimal viable product, but we're going to build it together because they're going to get on the job training of the cloud platform. One of my engineers is going to help guide them through the use of whatever platform, whatever service they're looking to do. At the end of that 30 days, they're going to have something they can actually use and then build from. But their guarantee was that they were going to subscribe to the cloud platform for the next year. Right. So it was kind of a win win in that they got something out of it, but we got the guarantee that they were going to be on the platform for the next year. And they got some on the job training from one of our engineers who was going to walk them through using the technology. That, from me, my perspective, sure, I wouldn't call it a proof of concept. I'd call it more of a minimal viable product. But there was a win win for both versus the POC route, which was okay, I'm going to invest 30 days doing something for you. You may or may not like what you get at the end of it. And you've got no obligation to do anything after I've spent it all that, you know, pre-sales, you know, equity in you kind of a thing. So that's kind of the way I've seen it change. And I think that the, the cloud model makes it much easier to deliver something much quicker and speed the life cycle of, you know, adopting software. And if we kind of shift the conversation to, you know, of course, we all know sales and pre-sales work hand in hand and, you know, they're kind of their technical resource guys as, 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 as such, but how would you say is the best way to align those resources within the sales and account management teams? So, pre so it's interesting you say that, and, and, and I'm gonna comment on something specifically what you just said, right? Because that for me would be conceptually the way it was visualized years ago, right? That there's just a technical resource. What I have done and tried to do in my organizations, and, and I would recommend anyone watching this to at least think about this, because what 
if you hire the right people, as we described earlier in this conversation, who are really are focused on discovery and value selling and those kind of things, and can build good relationships, you have the ability with your pre-sales engineering organization to actually be a demand generation lever as well. In that, they go to a customer, they get them on the platform, and they have established themselves as really sort of a trusted advisor on behalf of the customer when they have technical questions and they have you know, a net new need or those kind of things, right? And so they tend to reach out to. Look, let's use the minimal viable product example I just gave. I got an engineer on the phone with you for 20 days building something. You agree to buy the platform and you're gonna move forward. Well, if I'm a good sales engineer, I'm not going to leave that lose that relationship with you, right? Because I want you to renew. I want you to educate you on that new features. But I also want to know from you as you're moving forward, what is your next move, right? What, what other chess piece are you going to move that I can then apply additional services or surround what you just built with other things? Well, if I have that kind of a dialogue with you, now as a pre-sales engineer, I've just noticed and understood a new demand for my salesperson to go have another dialogue, right? That's, in my opinion, what they should be doing, right? Because you look at a sales rep, and let's just use round numbers. Account rep may have 15 accounts, all of which are in varying degrees of a sales cycle. They're either, some are net new customers, some are existing customers, some either trying to renew these or expand what they have or get these people to jump on my thing. But, you know, when they do, if, I should say, if they do a good job of looking at their business over a year, right, and they're going to do their quarterly business reviews, they're going to segment those 15 customers into the kind of maybe, but they're like in the 20th percentile of maybe moving forward. Here's five that are like, yeah, a good shot. And then I've got these couple that are really hot and heavy. Well, I'm a salesperson. I want to get paid on selling things and closing deals. So they're going to focus on those five, right? And that's where their head's going to be most of the time. Well, a good pre-sales and engineer ought to be able to look over those other 10 and figure out what relationships I have there and how can I dig deeper? Or these five that haven't bought anything from us, why haven't they bought anything? Oh, well, because they've got a multi-cloud strategy and they're already running Google and they're running by Microsoft. Or you know, they're a legacy shop that's got more stuff on premise and they're just trying to dip their toe in the cloud. How can I help them there, right? That's what I would say is really the better model is to have your pre-sales folks sort of divide and conquer at times from the sales folks and do their outreach in some areas while the salespeople do their outreach in others. And when those five get really hot that the salesperson's lead, you are obviously then the technical support mechanism. And, you know, you're also, if you're a good pre-sales engineer, you're the check and balance mechanism, right? Because sales folks get happy ears and they think, hey, you know, we can sell them X. And you walk in the door and say, hey, not for nothing, but they're telling me this is the problem and X does not solve that, right? So let's course correct, or this isn't as big of an opportunity as I think you perceive it to be, right? So they really have to be kind of a checks and balances as well. And and I guess for them to be able to effectively also do those, you know, checks and demand generation activities as such to be able to qualify which ones are still, you know, there's opportunities to have more business and relationships with those. Would you say that depending on the size of the team and the company and how stretched these, you know, pre-sales people are, is going to impact the ability to do that? Because I know sometimes in larger companies where there's a lot more structure, it becomes harder to, you know, offer or present that kind of, flexibility for the pre-sales guys to go out and do those, you know, qualifications and build those relationships because they're always, you know, one to three, one to four on the ratio of account executives to one SE. So within a startup, my personal experience talking to people in the industry is when you're in a startup, you're already wearing many hats. You're more likely to have that flexibility to, you know, broaden out and, and build those relationships with those existing customers. You know, that's an interesting question. I'd actually counter that argument. I would say the model I just described is probably harder in a startup in that, for exactly what you just said, you are wearing multiple hats. There isn't a lot of structure and process. And the biggest thing you have going against you is that you don't have brand recognition, right? So you, in a startup, in my opinion, you're not just introducing the technology, but you're introducing the company that you're bringing to the table that nobody has heard of or nobody knows, right? And obviously that depends on how long you've been a startup. But if you're a new player in the marketplace, I mean, there's 
in my opinion, nothing harder to overcome than brand recognition, right? So you spend a lot of time just selling the company before you even get an opportunity to sell the product. Yeah. Whereas in, in a larger organization that may have that ratio you just described, right? I've got, I support three sales reps and they're all on the East Coast and I'm like one to three. Well, okay, let's, again, let's just say across the three of them combined, they have 45 accounts. My, my gut still says at the end of the day, out of those 45 accounts, only 10 of them are really going to be true winners this year that have you know, a better part of 80% probability of closing. And now that I'm not traveling and I'm doing everything remote, it doesn't take me long in about three minutes to either send an email or a phone call. And if I do that six times a day, I've covered my entire account base in one week, just doing reach outs and trying to be a trusted advisor. Right, because I'm not worried about process. I'm not worried about brand recognition. You know, out of those 45, yeah. there's probably, let's just say, 10 accounts that have never purchased anything from us. But if I'm in a big software organization, they at least know my name. Right, it's not like I'm, I have to call a net new customer, go, hi, I'm so-and-so from Oracle. Let me explain to you what Oracle does. That doesn't happen. Right, I've already got the brand recognition. The introduction is really, I've seen, you know, your business looks like it's moving in this direction. I think we could have a dialogue for a half hour and how we might be able to enable or, or speed up the direction you're trying to go. And during your, your time at Freedom Pay and Open Legacy, you was, you know, le leading the pre-sales and, and customer success functions. How was you able to, you know, pitch or transition the pre-sales people to make sure that they were effectively using the time that they were given in a day effectively their the allocated time to do different activities and how was that kind of benchmark so it, it, that's a great question and so I, I had mentioned the concept of sort of industry awareness before when i was describing the pre-sales engineering role and i think that's important because it, one of those startups was a software focused business only right they were purely a SaaS platform right and so the, the discussion I gave to you about the minimal viable product and how a pre-sales engineer would work there was very, was very you know, important. Versus the other organization that, you know, though had a SaaS platform, had a heavy component of selling actual hardware and then having to do an implementation at physical locations. And so I differentiate that in that the role a pre-sales engineer played, depending on the industry that startup was in, very much change, right? You, you, one ended up being more of a pre-sales program management sort of a role where you're really managing logistics and schedule. So or there's technology, technology components involved in it, but it was really more of a logistical kind of a role because there was an on-site implementation that people had to be there, physical things had to happen, there were installations. Versus being a startup that's truly a SaaS company where you know, you're educating on the different parts of the platform that a customer can use, but you're guiding them through it, right? And so you have the opportunity to much to be much more evangelical and, you know, here are the new features, here's what another customer is doing versus being like hands-on doing that work and managing some set of logistics and, you know, supply chain and implementation. So I would say it, it changes depending on the industry. And if we go back now, to, just for the audience to hear, I, I would love just to go back to the start of your journey growing up, you know, how you first got into technology, where, you know, your passion for technology and moving into software came from, and just a bit of a journey, you know, in a brief overview of how you've got to, to where you are today, you know, having led some, you know, highly successful functions at some well-known cool. companies over the, over the years. Um, okay, I'll try to make this brief. Um, ironically, um, I really wasn't a computer kid per se, you know, but we didn't have a lot of video games and those kind of things. So, so I, I didn't grow up programming per se. I actually was a, you know, uh, we were very much into athletics and all those kind of things. And so when I went to college, sort of the creative side came out of me. I actually loved to draw as a kid and I wanted to be an architect, right? Actually build buildings and those kind of things. I really enjoyed that. And when I went to college, they said, well, do you have an art portfolio? And I said, no, no. why do I need that to use a T-square and measure stuff? Like, no. And they said, well, you know, we want you, you're going to need to spend your first, first year 
developing an art portfolio if you really want to be considered for the School of Architecture. And I said, well, wait a second here. You know, this isn't cheap. I don't want to spend an entire year not focusing on a major while I'm, you know, building clay pots and doing paintings just so that you can evaluate me to do that. So that's where, you know, I got into, you know, technology and computers. And I, you know, I can remember getting my first computer, um, you know, in, in college. And, you know, it was like, oh, this is magical. Like, wait a second, you're telling me I can plug this phone line into this thing in the back of this computer and all of a sudden now I can use Netscape and find stuff? This is great. So that's how it started, right? And so, you know, I was in college, you know, at a time where, um, you know, the, the real push was everybody needed to have internships on their resume so that you showed that during the summer you were going into corporate America and you weren't coming out of college green. And I had actually gotten an internship with Oracle when I was doing the, the stuff with the mobile agents and things. And I'm like, this is magical. I love this, right? Wait a second. You're telling me I can just go find things on the internet and there's this world wide web and you're going to want me to do HTML. And it just went from there because it had sort of a creative aspect to it because it was so new. It was nothing we had ever done before. And so I went from that and then, you know, the creativity started to come out even more when you were like, okay, well, now there's programming languages. Now you can build things. And I can build my own thing. I don't have to build his thing. And it just went from there. And I went into corporate IT. And I'm, you know, as you can tell, I have the gift for Gab. So <laughs> it was, you know, it became a lot less about writing technology and a lot more about explaining it to people and asking questions. And it was just like, okay, this is for me. You know, I know technology and people want to know what they ask me questions about technology. And I can answer those questions. Weird. Let's keep going. And that's kind of how it happened. I, I, I'm similar to you in, you know, growing up, we we when i was young you know five six seven we had the same situation where internet was you know you plugged the, the phone line into the back of, of the computer and you was on the internet and it was back then it felt, it felt so magical and you know you felt like wow we're, we're advanced so much from my mom and dad's days where you right. know, they didn't have some families didn't even have a tv so technology had developed so far but even to this day i would definitely not say i'm a technical specialist um, but I try to understand technology. And as, as you've said, being able to have worked in places like Oracle and, you know, learn through the internship and I guess studies to improve your technical knowledge and then you kind of translated it. And would you say moving, you know, over that transition period, moving into where you are today, that you kind of are happy that you made that move into Oracle and into technology and you've learned, I guess, so much things over the years. Um, and what would be your tips for people trying to get into technology that maybe aren't the most technical people because that's often you know a big point that makes people hesitate and scared to make that transition that's a good question i mean and you're just making me laugh a little bit i don't mean to digress but i'm just thinking about what you just said and i'm thinking to myself um you know back in we didn't even have call waiting so when you wanted to use the computer you had to make sure that no one else in the house wanted to use the phone for the half hour right so it's like this is just yeah this transition what I would say for people who are who are not technologists who want to get into technology, I think everyone tends to gravitate towards, well, I'm going to learn how to program. I don't know that I would do that. Instead, I would actually go and look at design principles, right? The five design principles, I would look at more enterprise architecture. And the reason I say that is, when you think about technology in the conversation you and I have just had, we've gone from everywhere from dial-up modems to Google Cloud Appliance, you know, to whatever. I mean, for them, the phone I'm speaking to you on probably has enough power. I could actually power a small airport just here, right? I mean, you just got to think about all those things that have happened. I would say understanding enterprise architecture is a much logical, more logical place to start because there's components of security. There's components of workflow. There's components of user experience. That will help someone who's not a technologist today whittle down where in the overall concept of an application or a platform they feel the most comfortable. Right? Because some people are more creative, right? And they can focus on the UI and user experience part of technology. Other people are much more keyboard oriented and they're going to focus on the security and the CI CD workflow or even the actual underlying you know, software code, whatever. But I think that's an easier place to start because I think it helps an individual area, you know, um, you know, narrow their area of focus in the entire technology spectrum versus just diving in and go, I'm gonna take a six month class in JavaScript. Okay, well, fine. Can you apply that to anything? No, but I can make things move on a web page. Okay, that's great. Nobody needs that right now. 
That, that's, that would agree. be my advice. I think that's a much easier way to dive into technology to see if you're interested in it. And over, you know, I'm going to just get a little bit personal now and just talk to you about having led teams, you know, it goes back to what, what would you say was the biggest lessons that you learned, you know, along your journey in terms of leading teams? What did you maybe get wrong in the early days and what was you able to, you know, I guess everyone wants to be around 18 players for you to really elevate and learn and develop, you know, and challenge yourself at the top level. But where would you say was the biggest, you know, challenges you faced and how was you able to, you know, turn those around and, and make them positive experiences? Sure. So I think I'll give you the challenge and then I'll tell you the beginning and then the end. And I think I kind of covered this when I was describing sort of the, the type of people that you put into these pre-sales and customer success roles, right? And so, you know, early on, I did make that mistake where you'd find, you know, the, the Uber programmer, the guy who was very, very capable of, you know, bites and bits and, you know, talking at nauseam about how to build the clock and not realizing quick enough that all the customer asked was what time it is, right? And so... I, the, the, I I learned pretty quickly that you couldn't take the best of the best developers and have them be comfortable in front of a customer, even if you showed them, even if you champion it with them, even if you let them watch you do it a couple of times. It, that's, it doesn't come naturally. So the learning out of that, I think, really is, at least from a pre-sales engineer, and frankly, this goes for any executive, is constantly providing feedback to your organization and your employees, and then being smart enough to make sure that the folks that are good are in the role they want to be, but have a vision to the role they want to go to next. And the folks that are struggling more are actually in the right role in the first place. That's really, I think, what I have found is the real learnings, right? Because people want to do well. People want to work hard. But if someone's not in the right role and, they're in ta and their daily life feels like they're just beating their head against the wall, they're going to get discouraged. They're going to stop learning and they're going to go through the motions. And then they're unhappy. They don't perform well. You're not getting the best out of them. So identifying often and early if a person really is in the right role and if they're not fitting them into the role that really makes them much more useful and productive within the organization has to happen very, very quickly. You got to give the feedback. They've got to give you feedback and you've got to be smart enough to listen to it and identify the career goals and career paths someone really wants to go achieve to make sure you've given them the opportunities to do it. Keeps people much more engaged. And I guess like that part where you mentioned, look, if somebody's not enjoying their role, they're not performing. I know so often, you know, companies say, look, we hired you for a pre-sales role. You're not, you know, doing the job well, you're, you're out the door. But wouldn't you say when you've, you know, identify what the challenges they're facing are and where their skills would best be aligned and you can shift them somewhere else in the business that they're still able to, you know, find their feet again. And, you know, often they excel expectations in terms of, from where they was in their last role and maybe underperforming to, you know, shifting and, and doing really well. Do you find that's been the case when you've adopted that approach? Uh, so honestly, you know, layoffs do happen. You know, there, there, you know, every business has, you know, an ebb and a flow. And sometimes there are business downturns where you have to make difficult decisions. And, and I mean, that's the ugly side of, you know, corporate America or, or any organization. I mean, it, it, that does happen. However, um, you know, I find that you can mitigate a lot of the pain that comes with that if you've taken honest feedback, you have a collaborative dialogue within your organization, right? I mean, a, a lot of organizations tend to be siloed in that, sure, the leader gives you the general high level of what we're trying to do and asks for status, but doesn't necessarily have more of an ongoing dialogue about not just what we're selling and who we're selling it to, but you know what, how are you learning? Right, right. Everybody, nobody's working forty hours, uh, you know, directly. Right. So you've got ten hours a week where you're not in front of a customer. What are you doing in those ten hours to sharpen the saw to better yourself? Are you giving back to the greater community organization, right? It, you know, did you create a presentation that was extremely business oriented that others within the group can use or leverage or morph into something else, right? 
those are the kind of things that you have to have from a true managerial and an executive perspective within your organization to really then be able to know the team, know the people, not just ask status on what they're working on, but are they successful? Have they learned something new? Oh, so you just took a class with AWS as a competitive group. Cool. Great. Would you do me a favor? I would like you to spend an hour, put together a presentation on what you've learned and share it with the other people, right? And it's just about empowering them to be their true selves, let you understand their DNA, and then understand if they're going down the path they want to be or going down another path, right? And then when that whole, hey, we've got to shrink the organization, you know, at least I always did, that there were opportunities to make me move my folks out of my current organization, but would be a fit in someone else's organization that's growing, right? And so there's not a layoff, there's a transition. You know, he, Bill's not going to be on my team any longer. And that's okay. I like Bill. If Bill's really good at UI and that's what you're focused on, let's move Bill over there. But it really comes down to that whole, you know, I think Kim Scott was the one who wrote that book. It's called Radical Candor, right? But it's being able to have that kind of dialogue and know your people so that when something like that happens, you can pivot and look for opportunities. Uh, I, I agree completely. And just, just on the, the topic there of teams, um, I just wanted to find out from you personally, when we talk about, you know, nowadays, I, I speak to so many leaders and they talk about not being scared to fail. Uh, in the last few positions you were in, was you in a position where the company had the flexibility or you as a leader really championed that idea of, look, don't just do the normal, you know, things that are expected, but don't be, I, I want you not to be afraid to try new things and, you know, try to elevate what we're offering here because, right. you know, sometimes companies really push that and I think it's successful when, you know, people really have that confidence that, hey, my manager's behind me. And they want me to, you know, try different things, thinking outside the box and, you know, the sky's your limit if you can really take that and run with it. So I'll flip that a little bit. Um, so I always wanted to champion organizations that were not afraid to think outside the box. However, what I would say to you is my challenge was fail fast. <laughs> Don't care what you try, but fail fast, learn from it. And know that we've gone down a path. It's not going to work. Let's get back to, you know, let's course correct and still satisfy the needs of the customer, right? Because I'd rather have this epiphany and you try something for three days a week and you realize that it's just not going to work for this particular situation. Cut the cord on it and, you know, course correct for the next week versus taking that big fatal leap. Six months goes by and you realize that, you know, we've got all of this manpower expended into something that's just not going to float or it doesn't match closely enough to what the customer was trying to do. And now I've wasted six months worth of failure. Fail fast, right? And be vocal about failing fast in that I want you to talk and have a dialogue with the sales team and the sales rep that says, I know what you've told them. That's not going to work. We can't do what they're looking to do, or at least in the way that they want it be, to be done. And we need to have an honest dialogue today, right? Not six months through the sales calls and, you know, five, you know, 15 phone calls later, now you're going to finally be honest that we can't do this. That doesn't work. All you've done is create now a huge customer satisfaction problem that I now have to pass on to the customer success part of my team that has to go <laughs> solve that, right? So yeah, yeah, fail fast, but, but don't be afraid to try, just fail fast. And it, and I guess on what you said there, failing fast, the, the lesson that many learn, I guess there is from, from failure, you learn things, right? When you're highly successful and, you know, things are going well, that's when people tend not to, you know, really take a large learning lesson from those, those experiences. So I guess those are what I, that, that was really what I wanted to get to. And just sure. on, on, I, I the, the extra stuff you're doing as well. You're, you, you've been a professor at Buffalo University for over 20 years now. I just wanted to, you know, the audience to find out a bit more about what you do there um, and how sure. you're giving back to the next generation, which is something I'm, you know, highly passionate about. And even within my inclusion of the pre sales Collective is something that I'm trying to uh, champion and push forward as well. Sure. Well, also a very interesting story, right? So I, I, got, I actually got approached by the university as a very young kid. I mean, I was young. <laughs> Let's put it that way. 
But I, again, I was passionate about technology and, you know, they were just, they, they needed folks that understood the up and coming things and they wanted to get people that were not as academic to come in and, you know, teach students, but then also teach, you know, what they, you know, they would call matriculating stu students here, which are, you know, people that work during the day, but then get educated at night kind of a thing, right? So I taught, you know, engineering courses, internet courses, probably the first two or three years in, in person in class. I ended up having to relocate and said, okay, well, you know, we're going to have to, we're going to terminate our relationship, right? You, you know, obviously can't teach from, you know, 600 miles away. And they say, well, it's interesting. We just purchased and have a relationship with uh, a, a company that offers this package called Blackboard. And it's online learning. Would you want to pilot this? I mean, and this goes back years. This is way before COVID or any of those kind of things. So I said, sure. I relocate and I start teaching classes online via Blackboard. And it's great. I'm teaching operating systems. I'm teaching programming languages. And it just kept going. And I did it for years. I was teaching, you know, Android development and all those kind of things. Because and it's fun because, A, I like to explain how things work to people. But, B, it keeps you as a professional very sharp on the technology because you've got to know it to be able to teach it. The last couple of years, what I've been doing more for the university is helping them build curriculum, right? Because you get someone in academia who, let's use uh, machine learning, right? They've been studying machine learning for 10 years, but they want to teach Python. They want to teach this, that, and the other thing. And that's great. But a lot of them don't keep up with what's really in the marketplace today. So what I try to do is I help the university structure content and courses in line with what I see on job postings today for right out of college students. JavaScript, NoSQL, um, you know, all those kind of things, Re you know, different web frameworks like React or Angular. That's what I've been doing a lot more lately is helping them, you know, finalize, con you know, finalize courseware and then help build the content and do reviews and teach some of those courses that are more relevant on a student's resume today to get hired. So it's, it's, enjo it's enjoyable, right? And I mean, at the end of the day, for the folks that are watching, these are probably kids that are going to be your future IT staffers because they're learning things that are relevant to what your business is looking to do today. It's, it, as you said, it's something that, especially in universities, even when I was studying, you know, 10, 15 years ago, we was using Blackboard as well. So I, I definitely understand the value it brings and the fact that you're able to be like a consultative partner to the university and explain to them, hey, you know, technology's advanced in the last five, 10 years. These are the new you know, database topics or solutions that are in the market. Right. These are going to be the tools that companies are going to require you to have skills in. So it's, it's something, I guess, that you're doing that's really good for the community, but also the next generation of tech, you know, people that want to get into the industry. And just um, before we close up um, the discussion, I just wanted to ask a few questions about, you know, general things like your favorite food, your favorite songs, and uh, your favorite holiday destination is something random, I know, but it's something that I like just so people have a little bit of a, uh, a knowledge personally about yourself and feel sure. maybe a little bit more connected to you. And then a question, I'll give you time also to think of a question to ask the next leader that I have on the show that is maybe an, something you're intrigued by or would like to have somebody's outtake on that's a pre-sales or a sales leader. Sure. Okay, that's that's a handful. Let, let me let me take I'll take a stab at this. So, um, I'm a foodie. I, I like to cook. Um, you know, I, I cooked more through COVID than I probably have in the rest of my life. But you know, it, it comes back to my I think my creative nature and cooking to me is is creative. Um, I tend to eat more of a sort of a European style diet, so I do do a lot of seafood. Um, you know, I don't make my own sushi, but you know, a, any meal I typically have is. Some some seafood along with vegetables. And those, those are my favorites. Now, is that if you said, hey, I could have one last meal tomorrow, my, my last meal tomorrow would probably be my mother's spaghetti and meatballs. <laughs> but I try not to eat as much pasta anymore, but that would be the ultimate. Um, Music-wise, um, it, it's funny. I was a country music guy for years. I still do a little bit. But, you know, my son and I, are we, we tend to work out a lot together, and it tends to be more rock and roll slash heavy metal-ish just because, you know, you're in the gym and you're, you know, country music's not going to be what you're going to get really pumped up on. So 
I go back and forth between those two. Um, you said favorite destination. Um, geez, I don't know. You know, I, I, it's, it would be easy to say the Bahamas or Bermuda or South Carolina. Um, I've only been to Europe once or twice. I think I'd love to go to Sicily or Italy or Greece. I, I think that would be, you know, somewhere on the Mediterranean would be very, very unique. And, and I haven't done it yet, but I think it would be it would be pretty cool. Um, you know, I think the idea of one of those victory Mediterranean cruise ships going up and down the Med would, you know, we pretty pretty, pretty good, good uh, you know, 10-day span to, to kind of go do. Um, well, hopefully, and then the question, hopefully you the can go down there. And, and then you said the last question was, what, what would be the question I'd have for the next person that you tend to interview? Um, I always thought a good question is, um, you know, tell me about your biggest failure and, and, and tell me what you learned from it. Right. Because, you know, to back to the earlier part of this conversation, fail fast. And, and, and sometimes we don't fail fast. Right. Sometimes, you know, we you, you go a year and, you know, as an example, you structure an organization a way that you think is going to be the most productive only to realize that, you know, you and inadvertently had put in a lot of bumps and, you know, cogs in the system that didn't need to be there. Right. And so the question would really be, you know, what have you done that did not work and what did you learn from it? And then how did you fix it? Perfect. Well, on the next episode, we'll be sure to get that question out there. Um, oh, I can't wait to see middle. the person answer that one. No problem. I'll, I'll make sure it's, it's a guest that will have a lot to say on that topic, no doubt. Good. And um, I want to, again, thank you, Sean, for your time uh, today. It's been great having you on the show. But more importantly, giving everyone a chance to understand your take on pre-sales, your lessons, um, the challenges you faced, and hopefully, you know, moving forward, we can have you on the show again. Be happy to be here. I appreciate you having me. This has been enjoyable. It was a good conversation. And I hope that the folks that end up watching this or at least listening to it in the future get some little nugget that says, hey, I, I you know, that makes a lot of sense and, and we should probably try that. Definitely. I'm sure they will, Sean. Uh, I know it's only, you know, 11 o'clock uh, there now, but I'm sure you'll have a great week and we'll reconnect again soon. Thanks again. Absolutely. Sounds like a plan. Thank you, Sean.